Preface. I hope people will read Manning Johnson's pamphlet carefully. If you do, you will understand how the communists have used and are using certain American Negroes to the detriment of all Americans, white or black. Page 7. I was lured into the Red Movement by the way of the American Negro Labor Congress, one of the many front organizations set up by the communists to trap the naive, unwary, unsuspecting, and idealistic Negro. Page 18. Stirring up race and class conflict is the basis of all discussions of the Communist Party's work in the South. Page 13. A number of Negro ministers are all for the communists. Some are prominent and influential, others are run-of-the-mill. They in common believe that beating the racial drum is a shortcut to prominence, money, and the realization of personal ambitions. The question is not whether people are discriminated against. The question is, how effective is that discrimination, and to what extent does it ex explain income differences? Because many of the groups that are above the average income in the United States and in other countries are groups that have demonstrably been discriminated against in various ways. The Jews, ways. The Jews would be yeah. classic. The Japanese also. Yeah. Uh, and the Japanese make almost one third higher income than the average American. So the question is not whether there's been this uh, interracial friction and so on. That's existed everywhere and down through history. The question is, how much can you explain the income differences that way? If there is evidence that you have, let us see that evidence. Mm -hmm. What I think is really tragic is that assertions have been made not only without evidence being offered, but without anyone even asking for evidence. They say there's one woman in the Senate, therefore. Or they say that women make X percent of the income of men uh, without bothering to find out what percentage of those women are working <coughs> part-time, what percentage of them are re-entering the labor force after 20 years of having children, et cetera. Rather than saying, let us compare now women who chose to stay in the labor force continuously since high school, on into their 30s, let's say, compared to men who did, and see how, how do they compare. And there, these great differences tend, tend to disappear. In some cases, the women make more. Page 29. The communists, through propaganda, have sold a number of intellectuals the idea that the Negro section is as ghetto, that the white Americans created it, set its geographical boundaries, that it is the product of race and hate and the inhumanity of white Americans. Therefore, it is a struggle of a Negro against white oppressors for emancipation. Naturally, those holding such views have no community pride, no interest in doing anything to improve its services. In this way, they paralyze the Negro initiative and resourcefulness, casting the race in the mold of one that is incapable of producing anything for the advancement of society. Obviously, this line deliberately spread by the communists leads to the worst kind of mischief. It strengthens and creates racial prejudice and lays the basis for sharp racial conflicts. Shrinking social responsibility and blaming others may be the easy way, but it is only a shortcut to communist slavery. Page 43. The red propagandists distort the facts concerning racial differences for ulterior motives. The incitement of racial warfare places all ills of the Negroes at the doors of white leaders in America. Capitalism and imperialism are made symbols of oppressive white rule. To one familiar with the Reds' tricks, it's obvious that placing the blame of all Negro ills at the doors of white leaders in America is to remove all responsibility from the Negro. This tends to make the Negro blame others for his failures, ignore the countless opportunities around him, or look for easy and quick solutions as a substitute from the harsh realities of a competitive struggle to get ahead. The result is a persecution complex. A warped belief that the white man's prejudice, the white man's system, and the white man's government is responsible for everything. After the 60s, black America turned around and began to, to we put our fate in the hands of white America. We became dependent on white America. We said we have to have this and, and we have to have that and, and uh, we have to have affirmative action. We have to have this kind of a program and so forth and so on. All these these demands that we made, and w which then, of course, come out of a psychology of dependence, um, where I can't get ahead unless white America gives me all these things, and white America bends over backwards and uses affirmative action to get me in here and get me in there and so forth. I can't do it on my own. I can't be self-sufficient. I can't take care of myself. Such a belief is the way the Reds planned on it, for the next logical step is hate, 
that can be used by the Reds to accomplish their end. The fact that the Reds have never contributed anything tangible to the progress of the Negro is overlooked, though the Reds have collected millions of dollars as a result of race incitement. Like the Communist Party, the NAACP has collected millions of dollars through the exploitation of race issues. The bigger the race issue, the bigger the appeal, and the bigger the contributions. Yet one cannot find any report of any of this money being spent on factories and ships to provide jobs land and home construction, specialized training for talented youth, or combating crime and juvenile delinquency. Page 35. They are the ones who devise the methods and techniques used by their puppets to destroy the reputation and influence of those who stand in the way of the Negro liberation juggernaut. The Reds call those persons Uncle Toms. In their usual, diabolically clever way, the Reds took the name of a fine, sincere, and beloved character made famous in the greatest indictment of slavery and transformed him into a dirty, low, sneaky, and treacherous coward. This the Reds did in order to make the name Uncle Tom a symbol of social, economic, and political leprosy. No man dare stand up and proclaim the convictions counter to the Red agitation without running the certain risk of being pilloried. The Reds, their fellow travelers, leaders of the NAACP, and other race agitators have created an ideal climate for such persecution. Page 37. The top white communist leaders know that racial as well as other differences between people have existed over a long span of years and will continue to exist even after centuries of re-education under communist rule. They also know that these differences can be used to play race against race, nationality against nationality, and class against class to advance the cause of communism. As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. Posing as a friend of the Negro under the guise of a campaign for Negro rights set race against race in the cold-blooded struggle for power. Page 52. Labeling opponents is a specialty of the Reds. Smear is a cardinal technique. Any label found in the red stockpile, you may be sure, is carefully made and selected to draw the maximum hate to the person or persons, the group or the organization to which it is attached. The use of such labels has a tendency to divide America. Page 53. The media of public information is far from free of communists and fellow travelers who operate under the guise of liberalism. They are ready, at all times, to do an effective smear job. Now, speaking of what the media says, you have uh, stopped giving interviews for the last couple of years. Yes, I should have start, stopped uh, many years <laughs> before that, actually. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> uh, I see no correlation between what I say and what the media reports. Uh, one of the most uh, hideous things that I've seen reported in, uh, was on the CBS Morning News, where they said, or suggested, that I uh, was a believer in the uh, theory of genetic inferiority of blacks. Now, I have been arguing against that theory for more than 10 years, and I don't know how many books, how many articles, and how many lectures. Among the red tools may be found editorial writers, columnists, news commentators, and analysts in the press, radio, and television. They go overboard and give top news coverage to racial incidents fomented by the leftists, and those incidents that are interpreted so as to show biased attitudes of whites against Negroes. This is a propaganda hoax aimed not at helping the Negro, but at casting America in a bad light in order to destroy its prestige and influence abroad. In the meantime, the Negro is a sacrificial lamb, the innocent victim of widespread racial hate which leftists are creating. The energizing of race hate is an asset to the Reds' cause the more the merrier, so as long as it erupts in cross burnings, threats, loss of jobs, refusal of loans, boycotts, bombings, fistfights, beatings, and shootings. 
page 54. Many white Northern politicians objectively aid the rapidly deteriorating racial situation through the exploitation of leftist propaganda in order to garner Negro votes. Some more white liberals came along with the 13th, 14th, and 5th Amendments, which were, which were supposed to solve the race problem. The problem is still here. Uh, nine years ago, nine more white liberals, so-called, came up with what they call a Supreme Court desegregation decision, and the problem is still here. And then another white man named Kennedy came along running for president and told Negroes what all he was going to do for them if they voted for him and they voted for him 80 percent. He's been in office now for three years and the problem is still here. So we are within our rights and with justice, with justification, when we uh, express doubt concerning the ability of the white man to solve our problem and also when we express doubt concerning his integrity, concerning his, his sincerity. They care not a tinker's damn about a southern Negro and simply flatter the northern Negro, who they consider a gullible fool. Getting elected and re-elected is their only concern. Page 62. Nearly after a century removed from slavery, they are unwilling and incapable of throwing off their slave psychology. Red and political charlatans of all shades, aware of this fact, find the Negro intellectual easy prey. While race has been an important uh, detriment to blacks in, in general historically, uh, I doubt whether it is a, an important or as important uh, detriment today. Um, I think for all intents and purposes in the United States that uh, blacks do have their constitutional guarantees and the problems that blacks face today uh, are not really race. Um, uh, that is, the civil rights struggle is over and won in the United States, which doesn't mean that, uh, that all the problems have come to an end, but what it does mean is that they're, uh, they're not civil rights problems. And I'm not denying the existence of discrimination, but what I hold and what my colleague Tom Sowell holds is that discrimination just cannot explain all of what we see. Um, it, uh, it has nowhere the explanatory power that it used to have. They know that to hold a comparable job, they must be just as good, and in most instances, better. Though a number of Negro intellectuals try to convince them that the cry for discrimination is a good substitute. Page 58, the Negro businessman has always been a chief target of the Reds. They despise him because of his conservatism. They label him a tool of white imperialist and an enemy of the Negro masses. Such labels are reserved for those the Reds plan to liquidate. And since the Negro businessman is an inspiration and an example to other Negroes, he is therefore an object of derision by the communists. Page 61, betrayal of the Negro people may come through communist corruption of the Negro intellectual. This is not so difficult since the communists, the white liberals, and the white progressives do the thinking for them. And as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves, to have different ideas, and it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the US, US Senate rather than hung from a tree. Page 56, any real investigation of communism or pro-communism among Negroes is headed off, defeated, or driven into a blind alley. Color and race becomes a sanctuary. On the one hand, patriotic and honest politicians and officials do not dare invade it critically without dire consequences to their personal reputations. And on the other hand, this same sanctuary becomes the playground not only for the Reds, but also for the hypocrites, the demagogues, the bigots, the self-seekers, the opportunists, the conniving politicians, and other dregs of human society. Too few Americans in our day have the courage of their convictions. Too few will fly in the face of leftist opposition. Too few will stand up for truth in the face of an ominous and destructive storm of Me Tooisms. Page 64. 
Under the guise of struggling for Negro rights, they have created all the explosive material for racial violence, making impossible demands, resisting sane and just decisions, opposing compromise and adjustment, and demanding that everything must be done forthwith or not at all. They have no love for their own people, and they have no love for America.